All right, I'm gonna get started. So, hi, good afternoon, everybody. How is everybody doing? Does anyone think that container networking is more complex than it should be? Is anybody thinking about migrating from IPv4 to IPv6? If you're running stuff in the cloud, do you know if your cloud provider supports IPv6 at all? Well, those are some of the things that I've been wondering myself lately, so I wanted to share some of the findings with you. My name is Nicolas Leiva. I work for Cisco. And the, I'm gonna be talking about how to run IPv6 enabled containers in the cloud. So the way I broke down this talk is basically three main parts. We're gonna first take a step back and discuss the basics of container networking. Then we're gonna see and um, discuss how IPv6 could help in this context. And then we're gonna do a reality check and see what's possible, what you can do today in the cloud. All right. So, container networking. Let's assume we have a virtual team or instance or node in container uh, terminology. You typically have uh, an interface, the main interface that provides you connectivity uh, to the rest of the world, I guess. And you are gonna have a Linux bridge that is gonna let you connect the containers that you're gonna be deploying in this host. You're gonna be deploying or allocating private IP addresses to your containers because we don't have enough uh, public IP addresses for this purpose. And if th those containers need to reach external hosts, you're gonna use network address translation in order to map your private uh, internal IP address to an external global IP before address. So let's connect a container to your Linux grid. A container is just a process, a group of processes running on a, I'm sorry, running on a different set of namespaces. For the purpose of this talk, the only namespace we're gonna be referring to is the networking namespace. So this container is gonna be connected to the main namespace via this uh, Linux bridge. You're gonna also, and this happens behind the scenes, behind the curtains, the container runtime is gonna limit the use of those resources, like networking resources, via another Linux feature, which is cgroups. So we're gonna add an additional container, and you can run as many nodes, or as many containers as you want to on a VM, given the resources that are available for you on that machine. If those resources are not, not enough to run your application, you can, of course, um, add additional nodes. So let's first look at how you would do a uh, packet forwarding between two containers running on the same host. So you will send the packet to the Linux bridge and then just do packet switching to the other application running in this other container. All right, let's add another node. So you have two virtual machines that are gonna be running containers for your application, right? So in this picture, it just, uh, the interconnection, it's just a big layer two domain. Most experienced network designers would recommend against having a big layer two domain. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume that that's how we're gonna interconnect these two nodes. But because you're gonna have a large number of containers, you're gonna want to rely on something that is gonna help you to manage all these containers. And not only because you want to manage the containers themselves, but also you wanna um, provide service life cycle, you wanna have some visibility, monitoring capabilities, and also get some help when you hit the fan when, for, to handle failure scenarios. There are many options out there for container orchestration systems, but I, would, I think the most popular one uh, nowadays is Kubernetes. So we're gonna be focusing on Kubernetes today. Let's look at how you would do packet forwarding in this scenario. It, again, you'll send the packet to this uh, virtual switch, then send it uh, to the external or underlying infrastructure you, that you have for networking. Let's just assume for now it's just a switch that is also gonna do uh, packet switching. 
and then uh, follow the same path in the other node. All right, so Kubernetes. Why? Because it's mo the most popular one uh, nowadays in the network, though, could take or can come in different shapes and forms. We just discussed that one way to do this is by just having a big layer two domain. But there are other alternatives, like have a routed network or have an overlay network. And there's many other cases. And because of that, is that Kubernetes actually does not actually configure the network. It relies on something else. And that something else is typically a CNI plugin that is gonna be handling all the networking for you. It's gonna be configuring your network, which is specific for your scenario. And, but Kubernetes does come with some requirements. And these are the three main principles that Kubernetes requires for, from any CNI plugin in order uh, to meet these requirements and provide connectivity for the containers. What it needs is basically that all containers can communicate with all of the containers without using NAT. And that they, the IP they use it is, has no translation whatsoever. So they see the IP as the same one that they originated the packets from. Um, so the network is just that, something is the cloud. And where do you run these uh, Kubernetes clusters? A cluster is just a pool of machines, several uh, nodes that are gonna have containers on it. So you can run this on-prem in your local data center, or you can run it in the cloud, on a, on a cloud provider. They have managed Kubernetes services, so it's pretty convenient. The important thing here is that in a distributed architecture, the network becomes a key element because it's, because it's gonna provide the interconnection between all these uh, microservices. I uh, just gonna remove pain point, but anyways. Uh, but what if we have two clusters? So your application keeps growing, so you wanna scale this horizontally, and you're gonna have two independent clusters one running on, a, on cloud provider one, the other one running on cloud provider two. Or it could be one running on, on your data center because your data is sensitive and you don't want to put it in the cloud and you just do the processing uh, or whatnot. So let's do packet forwarding between these two independent clusters. And what we have in between is just the internet, right? So we're gonna send a packet that is gonna go all the way exit your first cloud provider, and then it's gonna be dropped. Why? Because you cannot route private IP addresses over the internet. That's why you need NAT. You need public IP addresses for this purpose. That's why we do address translation. So how you would solve this problem is by having a direct connection between these two different sites. That direct connection could be a physical connection, a direct connection, direct connect, is sort of the service that cloud providers offers, or it could be a logical connection, like a VPN tunnel that you set up between two different endpoints, typically a virtual router. But then just one connection might not be enough for redundancy purposes or capacity-wise or whatnot. So let's just first look at how you do the packet forwarding. It goes through the, this logical tunnel, VPN tunnel, and gets to the destination, right? So we're gonna add now a second tunnel, just so you have redundancy and additional capacity. Uh, most cloud providers have limitation of, um, on the bandwidth that you can run through a VPN tunnel. So this still look fairly okay, not too complex, something that you can still manage, it's just two, cluster, two tunnels, but what if you add an additional cluster? Now you have three. Still not too complicated, you might need three or six different uh, interconnection between the sites. But let's make it even more interesting. Let's add a fourth uh, cluster. Now you need to start thinking about your network design. Is it gonna be half and spoke, where you have a central site that is gonna be the transit node 
for all the interconnections, for all the connectivity between the different clusters, or you're just going to have a full mesh. The full mesh does offer some benefits, uh, better connectivity, um, less latency, but the number of links exhibit a quadratic growth that is proportional to the square of the number of clusters. So in this case, six links. But then if you have five uh, clusters, it's going to be 10 links. So I think you know what I'm trying to get at, right? So how can IPv6 help? Well, let's take one step back and review some basics of IPv4. IPv4 was first defined uh, back in the 80s, and it's the fourth version of the protocol. And the important part here is that it uses four bytes for addressing the, in the host on the internet. Uh, soon enough, they realized that we wouldn't have, or we would eventually run out of IPv4 addresses, that we wouldn't have enough addresses for each, let's say, person in the world. And so they came up with some transition mechanisms like NAT and private IP addresses. So in numbers, we only have um, 3.7 billion addresses, public uh, addresses, IPv4 addresses. And if you compare that to the world population, it's not enough. They have estimated that by the end of 2019, there's going to be 3.2 billion people uh, online. And then in terms of oh, if you want to get an IPv4 address today, if you're a provider, the, the price of each IPv4 address is around $20. That means if you want to get an slash 24, you're going to have to pay around $5,000. And if you want a slot 16 with 60K addresses, it's going to be over a million dollars. And that's something that companies are doing nowadays. You can see like Amazon is getting uh, IP addresses from companies that back in the day go larger um, allocations. Those companies are actually sitting on a gold mine. So IPv6. It is, uh, there is no version 5 of the protocol. They went straight into v6. And among other capabilities, it provides an exp expanded address, uh, address space. They increase the number of vets you can, do, uh, you can use for addressing your host from 32 to uh, 128, or 16 bytes. The talent zone is, even though this is great from the point of view of the addresses that we have available, that is not, it is not backward compatible uh, with IPv4. So the transition has been really, but really, really slow. It's been like 20 years, and the adoption is around 28% last time I checked. In numbers, the number of global IPv6 addresses available is huge. I'm not even try to say that number that you can see on the screen, but I got this quote from um, a website that you can assign a public IP address to every atom on the surface of the Earth, and you still have enough addresses left to do another 100 plus Earth. So we have enough addresses for all computers, for all IoT devices, for all applications running for a long, long time. All right. so. What would it look like if we were using public IPv6 addresses on our containers? You no longer need VPN tunnels between the sites because you can rely on your uh, underlying infrastructure or the internet to route your packets. You also don't need an intermediate device that is going to set up the VPN tunnel for you. I'm not saying you don't need VPNs because you can still run uh, encryption VPN at the host level or you can just run uh, encryption at the application level like by using something like TLS. And I think I know what you may be thinking is that by doing so, you're actually exposing your infrastructure to the internet. So, and you're correct. You are using public IPv6 addresses. However, if you're running containers today in the cloud, chances are that your containers do have uh, access to the internet. However, you are protected, protected by using NAT. You're doing a uh, translation of addresses. 
but don't get fooled by NAT. NAT does not drop packets. So that's not enough to protect your infrastructure. So the, the scenario is not too different. So let me try to address how you actually, how would you actually protect your infrastructure uh, in the cloud. Let's take AWS as an example. You have three different enforcement points. The first one is at VPC level, where you can apply ACLs to whitelist the traffic that is allowed to reach your infrastructure. So that's the first uh, enforcement point where you, so you can protect your infrastructure from unauthorized access. So if you have two sites, site A and site B, you can have an ACL that says, I'm only going to allow packets coming from site, site A. And then you can use the internet to forward those packets. And of course, you're going to be encrypting that traffic using TLS or VPN at host level. But if that's not enough for you, you can still use uh, a security, attach a security policy to your instance or VM. So that's another enforcement point where you can protect your infrastructure. But if that's still not enough for you, you can actually use uh, network policies on Kubernetes so you can protect yourself at container level. That translates typically into IP table rules in the host. So one thing that I wanted to also uh, touch on is basically how you do IPv6 subnetting. So how we're going to be allocating IPv6 addresses to our containers. How we're going to be splitting the IPv6 block you get from your cloud provider. So AWS will provide you uh, a slash 60 feet, 60, 56 IPv6 prefix today per VPC. That can be break down into smaller prefixes that you can go and assign to each one of your instances. So this is a, an example of how you do the IP, IPv6 subnetting. And how would this look like? You have this main prefix assigned to your VPC, and then you assign these smaller chunks of it, smaller IPv6 blocks for each one of your Linux switches on each one of the VMs. So your container runtime can allocate IP addresses from it. All right. OK, let's do a reality check. Is this possible today? Does anybody know? All right. Not OK. All right, so you can actually use IPv6 in some cloud providers. I would say only one cloud provider let you actually assign IPv6 addresses to an instance, and that's AWS. Most of the OpenStack public clouds also support direct IPv6. OK, good. Uh, the OpenStack cloud also supports IPv6. Good. Rackspace as well. All that goes to the recording. So yeah, I was just looking the main ones. On. All right. then. You can also apply uh, security policies, uh, at least on AWS and Azure and probably OpenStack and Rackspace. But what you cannot do today is do exactly what I want to do, do IPv6 subnetting, to split uh, IPv6 prefix so I can assign smaller uh, IPv6 prefixes to each one of my instances, so my container runtime can allocate IPv6 addresses to my containers. Is there any alternative? Yes. Uh, this is the only way that I, that I was able to make this work, is by using this feature of AWS known as Elastic Network Interfaces. It's just a virtual network interface that you can attach to an instance. And you can map or assign IPv6 addresses to that uh, interface that you then attach to an EC2 instance. So let me do a walk through, through, all, through all the steps that I'm going to take in order to make this happen. So the first thing that I'm going to do, because I'm going to have to allocate IPv6 addresses, I'm going to come up with, a, with an IPv6 addressing plan. OK? So then I'm going to select the IPv6 addresses that I'm going to be using and assign those to my Elastic Network interface. This Elastic Network interface is going to be attached to a VM. At this point, all these IPv6 addresses are going to be automatically rerouted 
to my instance, which is my goal. Then I'm going to reconfigure my instance, the operating system running on that instance. I, I need to tell the operating system which addresses I'm going to be using for host communication and which addresses I'm going to be using to allocate to my containers. Then we're going to do some basic checks. First of all, verify that we can reach IPv6, external IPv6 hosts. Then I'm going to upgrade the operating system just to be a good citizen. I'm going to install Docker so I can install, uh, I can run containers. And then do some connectivity checks between the containers to make sure everything is working as expected. All right. So first things first. This is going to be my addressing plan. I'm going to set apart one IPv6 address for my uh, interface on the host. And also, I'm going to select a consecutive list of IPv6 addresses in order to artificially generate an IPv6 prefix. So that's one caveat about ENI. You need to manually select the IPv6 addresses. And then you translate that into an IPv6 network. So this is the four IPv6 addresses that I'm going to be using in order to create an SLAT 126 network. So all these interfaces are going to be part of my ENI. All right, so I'm going to select all them. And now I'm going to show you the exact command that you would use on Amazon to create this. As you can see, I'm creating a new network interface. It is a virtual network interface that is going to have all these IPv6 addresses assigned. There is no option to select a block of IPv6 addresses or an actual network, so you need to manually specify each one of them to create this uh, network. Now, at this point, uh, we just have this ENI, so I'm going to attach that ENI to an instance. And by doing so, I'm actually routing magically. That happens behind the scenes. I'm getting all those prefixes routed to my instance. This is the command that, we, that you would use to run an instance with an ENI attached to it. So yeah, run instance. The image ID, this is an Ubuntu image. The instance type, this is important. I'm going to uh, make a comment about this. And then you're just attaching uh, the ENI we just created. Now I'm going to reconfigure the instance just so it knows what IPv6 addresses it's going to be using for communication. So the first part is going to be configuring the main interface. I'm running, I'm going to be just using uh, Linux utility, uh, NetPlan, to configure that interface. Uh, it uses a YAML config file. I know people don't like YAML. It is what it is. So this is the, the config <coughs> file that you would modify. And then you just need to apply uh, this NetPlan command in order to assign that IPv6 address to your uh, instance. So at this point, I can actually go and verify whether I have connectivity to the internet using IPv6. Keep in mind, this is an IPv6 only environment. So I don't have any IPv4 address. Um, I'm sorry. So one thing you can do is go and ping uh, the address 2600 colon colon. That's an actual valid IPv6 address. Or you can ping any of the uh, IPv6 uh, capable websites. Uh, so this is the output of one of the tests. I didn't include all the outputs in the slide just so it wasn't too busy. But you can follow this QR code in order to see all the outputs uh, from this uh, exercise. OK, now I'm going to upgrade um, packages uh, on my operating system, in this case Ubuntu, because I want to apply the latest patches, uh, security patches, uh, and so on and so forth. The challenge, though, is that you're going to be grabbing those packages uh, from a package repository that is unfortunately not IPv6 enabled. This is the default that comes pre-configured on your AWS instance. So that's bad news. The good news is that there are other alternatives that you can uh, select in order to fix this problem. And it's a pretty simple fix. You just need to remove uh, that prefix from that URL. There are some other examples, but they all follow the same pattern. 
which is basically removing that, uh, that prefix that is specified that mirrors, mirror. So after doing so, you can go ahead and use an apt get to update packages on your machine. But then, of course, you need to force IPv6. You need to tell the command that you're going to be using IPv6. Otherwise, it's going to attempt to do it uh, via IPv4. And you, because you don't have an IPv4 address, this is going to fail. So it's important you keep these two things in mind. You need to tell apt get that you're going to be using IPv6 and that you modify uh, you, your sources.list file. All right, now we're going to install Docker. Let's see whether, whether that works. It does. The download.docker.com site does support IPv6, so we are good. So now we're going to configure uh, Docker to tell what is the IPv6 block we're going to be using to allocate IPv6 addresses from. And that's the slash 126 we chose at, at the beginning. So you just modify the Docker um, config and then restart the Docker daemon. All right, let's run a couple of IPv6 containers. If you just do a Docker run Ubuntu, it's gonna fail because Docker Hub does not support IPv6. It's not IPv6 enabled, so you need to go look at an, an alternative that is gonna help you run containers or graph container images uh, using IPv6. Fortunately, the Google Container Registry does support IPv6, so that's what I actually uh, used to download uh, an Ubuntu container image for this example. So next, I'm just going to do a connectivity check between uh, my containers. I just walked you through the configuration of just one container on one VM. I did this on another instance as well. And I'm not including the outputs in here, but again, you can follow that QR code to see the full outputs of this exercise and validate the config. This is the actual diagram of the actual test uh, we did. So the thought that I wanted to leave you with is that you can run IPv6 enabled containers in the cloud today. It is possible. It's not ideal. It's far from ideal, but it's possible. So you can start exercising IPv6. Of course, if you want better support or proper support for IPv6, the only way to get that is by asking for it. So I please beg you that you go ask your cloud provider for proper IPv6 support. Some of the ideas that I just discussed are very better explained or explained in greater, greater detail in this blog post. With that, uh, if you have any questions. If not, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>